the next segment here is uh, part of the Modi Youth uh, Education Summit. And, and we're noticing that since last March, teachers across the country have been working with students, much as we have as soccer professionals. We're all trying to actively engage youth in a remote distance learning environment. So students are hopeful, they're ready, they're even, <clears throat> they're even hungry for real experiences. Let's take a look at education in action through distance learning. All right, now I'll turn the volume on here so you can kind of listen to Gemma's voice. Technical training, striking a ball with the side of foot for passing and shooting. Player needs to place the standing foot alongside the ball with the inside ankle bone in line with the middle of the ball. The stride forward allows the kicking foot to be loaded, and as the foot is lifted off the ground, the foot shape should be heel down, toe up, ankle locked, with knee bent. As contact is made, there should be no further movement of the leg. The ball should be struck at the center of the ball, on the equator, with the inside arch of the foot. In most instances, at this point, the standing foot and kicking foot should be nearly perpendicular to one another. Can we do a count of how, how many times you say, well done? <laughs> <laughs> we can if you really want. <laughs> In this next segment, I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Ben Schwamberger, PhD to our educational summit. He is a profession, uh, an associate professor at Minnesota State University, Mankato, where he serves as the health and physical education program coordinator. He specializes in the training of future physical educators. His research interests focus on homeschool physical education and the occupation, occupational specialization of current and future phys physical educators. Ben has also been an elementary and a high school physical education teacher and a coach. Dr. Ben, it's all yours to introduce the next phase of today's teacher panel. All right, Alan, well, thank you very much um, for setting this up. We've got a couple great panelists. So I think the first thing I would like to do before we actually get into the question um, to them is give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. So I think we'll start with Seth <coughs> and Joe and then finish with Ben. Hi, um, I'm Seth Tunick. I work at Francis Parker School in San Diego. I do seventh and eighth grade PE. I coach uh, track, girls soccer, and uh, cross country. And I'm a 30 year club soccer coach at Crusader Soccer Club in San Diego. I am a physical education and health teacher at Rockford Middle School in Rockford, Minnesota. I've coached multiple sports at multiple levels and currently right now, and working with our junior high football program. Hi, my name is Ben Gort. Uh, I'm a bio teacher at Turtle Lake Elementary in Shoreview, Minnesota for grades one through five. All right, well, welcome all of you. So I think the big thing that we talked initially about um, when, we, when we were trying to get some ideas together was this idea of engagement. Um, and the aspect of engagement is so important in physical education in the virtual environment has really kind of created some unique circumstances, I think, for all educators, especially physical educators. So I think with this first question, looking at how all of you are trying to keep your students actively engaged in a virtual environment. And, and Seth, we can start with you and then Joe and have Ben finish it off. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good question. The engagement part is the tricky part for virtual learning, um, both in my classes and then even working with my soccer teams. Um, I, you know, looking at PE, I always felt like there's two aspects of it. One is the, the, the physical movement and all that. And one is the social aspect. So I've really tried to, to, to find that social aspect. So the key is, is engagement early. Um, so each class, and I actually got this idea from my director of, of coaching at my club soccer team, uh, Renee Maramontes. And he said, you gotta, you gotta get them early. You gotta, you gotta get them early in the first five or 10 minutes. So what we've been doing, like yesterday in our class, our first five minutes, we did, um, we asked a question. And it, the question was, was a, a hot dog a sandwich or not? And we went for a five minute discussion on that. But what happened was everybody participated. Everybody had an opinion. 
the rest of class, we worked on some soccer skills because we're in the middle of a soccer unit right now and everybody participated in. So I think if I have a recommendation to, to, to the teachers out there is get your classes engaged early on. Um, you do that, you have them for the rest of class. So take five, 10 minutes to find something fun for them to do. And then in turn, that's gonna turn into them being engaged the entire time. I also do some virtual games like scavenger hunts and, and trivia and stuff like that as well. So lots of fun things you can do to get them engaged. Great. Yeah, and you certainly need to use creativity, you know, and there are so many tools out there that are on the internet, different apps, different resources that we can plug into. Some of them cost money, some of them are absolutely free, but uh, the engagement that you can get from these apps and these different tools out there is unbelievable. And, and I'm very fortunate, the principal at my building that I work at, she has enabled us to actually purchase a few uh, of these really cool resources, these, these interactive types of, of uh, apps and, and different spots uh, similar to, um, I, I can, I'm trying to think of a couple offhand, Quizlet maybe, things like that where you can engage with your classes while you're, you're providing uh, quality instruction and, and interactive movement. I love that. Being creative, it's just like if we were in-person learning, being creative is, is super important to keep the kids engaged. I'm um, so like Seth was saying, um, getting them engaged right away and varying what you're doing. So you can have, I love those discussion questions because they want to connect with us and they want to connect with each other. And then also doing like a different warm up every day and just trying to keep it fresh so that they are engaged with what we're doing. I think it's also important to get feedback from the students, from the kids. Um, what do they want to learn? How is it going for them? What did they like? Then it can allow you to plan for your next lesson, class, whatever it is that you're doing. So it's super important for them to feel connected and engaged and to kind of embrace some of those things that maybe you might be hesitant, like letting them unmute or using the chat if they need to, to make those connections with each other. Um, because the content that we're teaching is obviously important, but it's not gonna matter to them if they're not feeling connected with each other or with us um, Yeah, in those classes. Even little things like music too, I think adding music to your, uh, to your classes and to your lessons are little things too that can, that can keep those kids engaged. Great, yeah, I think all those examples were were strong. I know Skip highlighted during his speech a little bit about that off-field support, with, which again for us is that rapport building for us. And again, if we can't build that rapport with those students, we're not going to be able to teach them in the manner we want, would like to. And I think, Joe, your example, highlighting the different resources out there, that's one of the things I've really learned throughout this semester um, through collaboration with colleagues from throughout the country is just the resources that I didn't initially know of. Again, a lot of them are free, and even the ones that aren't necessarily are, uh, free, we can potentially highlight a need for it with administration to potentially purchase that. Um, but I think all of those are great, great examples. The second question I wanted to highlight was the, the student equity piece, um, which is so critical, yet very difficult to try and ensure, especially in this virtual environment. So if each of you could kind of thinking about that Talk about how you are able to create that equitable environment, if possible, for students and or maybe highlight struggles that you yourself are going through. And again, we can look at Seth, Joe, and then finishing with Ben. Yeah, you know, so I know with virtual, the virtual world, you know, technology is a problem. I'm lucky at our school, and I am at a private school, and that's not much of it, as much of an issue as would be at a big public school. Um, but the one area that I find interesting, I was just thinking about this yesterday in my class, is just the settings they're in. You know, we're used to being on the field. You can see the field behind me. That's where I would be normally right now, probably. Um, but we don't have that. We're, we're, you know, kids are in a room or maybe outside or depending on where they are. And so the, 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 the struggle we have is just finding activities that they can do on camera in class that gets them to move and all that. And the interesting things that I find is I, with my PE class normally, when I'm out in the field, I don't really worry about homework and encourage them to, to go and do other things um, outside of class. But now I find myself really trying to get them, if they can't do stuff in class as well, is giving them stuff to do outside of class. So they're getting activity and, and stuff. And so even if they can't do what we're doing in class, they have an avenue to 
go outside of class and do that. So we've been using, Joe talked about using things. So we use Flipgrid a lot. Um, and so kids can go and go and go to a local park and record themselves and then share it with everybody. And I told them to be creative, add music, whatever you want. And that's been really helpful. And I think in the long run, kids are going out and actually doing stuff outside of PE class. They're doing some of the stuff we're doing outside of class. So I think that's been a positive um, in a tough virtual world, but the setting's always difficult, I think. Yeah, and there are different aspects of equity that we need to think about as teachers. You're talking about access to internet. You're talking about you know, Wi-Fi signal. If it's great in one spot, it might not be so great in the other. I had a couple of students the other day that had to log off of my classroom meeting because I, they claimed that I was breaking up. I don't know if that's bad on my end or their end, but either way, that's, that's certainly an everyday challenge. You're talking about uh, being able to distribute technology to families that might not have the capability of, of purchasing it, or maybe there might be one laptop for three or four kids and they have to find a way to share that throughout the course of the day. Uh, you're also talking about uh, facility challenge where, you know, if I'm gonna teach a lesson on, let's say I'm talking about uh, different workout variations of a plank, you know, there's lots of different things or squats, things like that. You know, I don't need a whole lot of space to do that. So that's gonna be something that's gonna work for pretty much everybody. But if I wanna bring out some equipment, how do I know those kids are going to have a soccer ball or a basketball? Or how do I know there's going to be space within their room or in their house or somewhere where they're, they're taking in my lesson where they can accomplish what we'd like them to do? So there's certainly limitations, but at the same time, there's fun challenges to this as well. And I always make sure to, to leave some time during my lessons for kids to contribute, saying, hey, you know, let's try this or let's try that. Or does anybody have any suggestions? for what we're doing in this space to make this a really fun conclusion to the lesson. Yeah, it's so important for us to just understand our population, whoever it is we're teaching, and what is their learning environment? What is it like? And I love what Joe just said about hearing from them too. Like what, if you, if I'm giving you this activity, I'm, if we're supposed to be doing this today, let me know if we need to adapt it in some way. Let me know if you can't do this or if we need to brainstorm more ideas so that you can do whatever it is that we're learning that day. Um, so if you're if you're teaching live, just being mindful about what equipment are you using? Can every student, does every student have that piece of equipment? If not, can they use something alternatively? I'm um, trying to come up with as many things as we can that does not require equipment. Um, or like Seth said, I'm um, giving them ideas to do, to go take it elsewhere, to go outside and do something. So just really varying what we're teaching and providing it to them, maybe with different platforms, whether it's live or whether you are pre-recording a lesson and submitting it to their Google Classroom, whatever it is, so that they can um, perform it whenever it's most accessible to them, or maybe recording a live lesson for those students who are missing it and then finding ways to submit it to their classroom teacher or whatever it is when it's easier for more accessible for them. So just really understanding our population, whatever population you're teaching or coaching their environment. Great. I think the two key takeaways from, you know, listening to all of you guys talk was the aspect of creativity and finding ways to still work with our students, right? Because as we all said, all of our students are going to have different resources, some more so than others, but in the end, we still have to find a creative way, I think, to, to get to them um, and make a meaningful impact to, on them. And then I think the second piece was that aspect of empathy, right? Understanding that all of our students are not equal and they have these different resources. So I think it's in our best interest to try and empathize with them um, to, to try and work through those issues. Um, so again, great, great responses. Alan, do you have any questions um, for our panelists to, to discuss? Actually, we have several, but we're running on, right on time. Uh, one that comes very quickly, so this is perhaps directed at you, Ben. Um, uh, have you noticed that there has been more parent involvement in what kids are doing in a healthy way or a negative way? That's a great question. I think any of our panelists could probably highlight that. Um, and I guess looking at you the, as the, from the panelist perspective, it might be, might be best for you to kind, kind of think about that because you have that direct involvement with the parents. So if whether it's Joe, Ben or Seth, any comments you can have with regard to that question about the parents? 
Uh, so, I'll just say that um, um, my my I've seen less. I've talked and seen less 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 from parents. Uh, the funny thing is, um, I've actually had a couple of times parents join in on the workouts and stuff. So uh, we're doing I feel we're doing some cardio workout, and then I look on one of the screens, and there's one of the dads right along their daughter working out and doing and having fun. So. Um, but for the most part, being middle schoolers, I, for, I work with, I think the kids are on their own. So I've had very little parent involvement, um, but if occasionally one will, will, will peek in. No uh, parent involvement either, but at the same time, while you're teaching, you know that, that quite often there's going to be a parent or a brother or sister, you know, fairly close by that may chime in. And, and certainly there has been a few occasions where a parent has, has, uh, mentioned some things that that uh, they liked about the lesson or maybe some things that that reminded them of you know previous experience that uh, they wanted to chime in and, and everything's been nothing but positive you no know, I, I haven't heard anything negative or seen anything bad i think that i think that parents are very empathetic of what's going on right now and and uh they're definitely uh you know there to to help more than anything else not to criticize yeah, my experience has been similar where I've only had positive parental involvement and it happens more as they go throughout my day because I teach my younger grades in the afternoon and because they're so young in first and second grade, they need help logging on the computers. So often in the afternoon, you see a parent's face before you see the student's face because they're the ones who need to do the logging on because the kids don't know how to do it yet. Um, or when there's technical difficulties, I guess. I don't see the parents unless... Some the kid can't hear you or you can't hear them and then they they call in their parents or whatever to help. Um, so only more more parent involvement with the younger grades, um, but only positive experiences on my end, fortunately. And I think one thing that really hopefully has happened is parents developing a heightened appreciation for what we do. Oftentimes, you know, physical education can be a very marginalized subject matter because parents have had poor experiences themselves. So that's reflected on what they assume is occurring within their son or daughter's um, physical education classes. But I think through this unique virtual environment, parents actually develop, like I said, a heightened uh, awareness of, oh, wow, this is really what they're learning in physical education, which I think is a benefit overall. Well, th those are fabulous comments. And uh, uh, we really appreciate you being part of this panel and obviously giving us the great information that you've got and covering all of the grades that we've got uh, should give a lot of people a lot of encouragement for, for their ventures into virtual teaching. So thank you all very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day.